Hello, our group is composed of Javiera Fernandez, Paola Ricci, Joaquin Cuevas, and Sofia Saronich. As a group, we chose two documents that are related to a contingent relevant theme that affect us profoundly as future teachers, but mainly as members of a developing society, which is constantly changing and moving forward towards the themes of gender and inclusion. Within these topics, you can visualize how language plays a major role in the configuration of school environments. To begin with, we are going to define seven key concepts that will show up throughout the video. These concepts are gender, sex, sexuality, feminism, culture, and patriarchy. The source we will use in order to define the concepts mentioned before is the Oxford Dictionary. According to the Oxford Dictionary, gender is either of the two sexes, male and female, especially when considered with reference to social and cultural differences rather than biological ones. The term is also used more broadly to denote a range of identities that do not correspond to established ideas of male and female. Oxford Dictionary has two main definitions regarding sex. The first one says, chiefly with reference to people, sexual activity, including specifically sexual intercourse. However, the second one makes reference to a different thing. Either of the two main categories, male and female, into which humans and most other living things are divided on the basis of their reproductive functions. Moreover, sexuality is the capacity for sexual feelings and a person's sexual orientation or reference. However, we will use the second definition in the video. Feminism is the advocacy of women's rights on the ground of the equality of the sexes. To Oxford, culture is a refined understanding or appreciation of culture. Patriarchy is a system of society or government in which men hold the power and women are largely excluded from it. To continue, we are going to explain the following documents. Language, Gender and Sexuality, Current Issues and New Directions by Deborah Cameron and Feminist Theories of Subjectivity, Judith Butler and Julia Kristeva by Roxana Elena Donku. The document by Deborah Cameron talks about the researches made by different authors in order to develop and explain theories regarding the diversity of gender identities and practices. One of the main topics in this text is the comparison made between two feminist approaches, the modern feminist approach and the postmodern feminist approach. The former stated that gender is socially constructed and implicitly assumed to give grounding to sex, which is defined as biologically based. While the latter defines gender as something that you perform and has an array of possible gender identities or positions, whereas sex itself is not natural, but constructed, given that biological facts are always filtered through social preconceptions about gender. Another approach is called conversational analysis, CA, which says that gender is relevant only to the extent that particip participants in interaction make them relevant through their own words and actions, and also is something that may be made relevant and has to be accomplished by participants in specific interactions. Furthermore, Cameron put special emphasis in the look locally, paradigm center on the concept of community of practice. COP views gender as something that emerges from practice what people do rather than what people intrinsically are. Language and gender are conceived in terms of the local practices of women and men. Other linguistic researches focus the attention of the mainstream forms of gender and the non-mainstream varieties. For some researches, the principal aim is to put alternative forms of gender, the mainstream ones, on the, the social linguistic map, politics of identity, visibility and recognition. But this is affected by the heteronormativity, the system which pres prescribes, enjoins, rewards and naturalizes heterosexuality as the norm that should be followed by all people. It, heteronormativity has a huge impact on the study of language and gender, and it is responsible of the appearance of sexuality next to gender. New theoretical approaches are important to lead the paradigm shifts. 
Feminist activity has been a major factor in the change of social conditions and the new political changes in our society, especially in terms of sexuality and gender and its implication on linguistics. Since about the mid-90s, researchers started to focus on the range of ways in which gender could be performed using the resources of linguistics variation, from the pronunciation of particular vowels to the selection of whole codes, all of these based on Butler's concept on gender, where gender is the repeated stylization of the body. Judith Baxter explained in her approach name, feminist post-structuralist discourse analysis, how boys and girls are positioned in school English classes, developing spoken communication skills. Her analysis shows how masculinities and femininities are being constructed by and for individuals, and how teachers' judgments about particular gender performances are affected by local discourse. Teachers tend to value the ability to take command in boys and the collaboration and sensitive listening in girls. At the same time, gender nonconformists often do not get peer support. Additionally, another area of research that puts special emphasis on the significance of sexual identities is the one which focuses on the non-mainstream limial or queer sexual identities, and in which heterosexual identities become an explicit object of attention. Sociolinguistics today puts special emphasis and interest on the investigation of linguistic performances of people, who identify themselves as members of sexual minorities, including not just Western gay men and lesbians, but also traditional non-Western categories such as Hijra of India, Kathui of Thailand, and Travesty of Brazil, and many others. This line of research goes parallel and intersecting with feminist research on language and gender because it also experienced the shift from difference to diversity. Sexual identities, like gender identities, are shown to be cultural and locally variable. Gender and sexuality not only inflect to each other, but they also are mutually constitutive. Numerous non-mainstream sexual identities studied in different parts of the world are conceived as forms of gender deviance and sexual deviance. Sociolinguistic significance in this has to do with how it is perceived the relationship between gender identity and sexual identity, given local context and how it is expected to influence the linguistic performance of both. An example of this is how so homosexuality is strongly as associated with gender crossing, where group members may exploit non-standard grammatical gender marking to display their sexual identities, use of pronouns, adjectives and articles. Conversely, this practice may be absent or stigmatized where gender and sexuality are separated. Penelope Eckert has studied the linguistic effects of the emergence of heterosexual market among pre-adolescent school children in the USA, where sexuality plays a huge role because it is one of the aspects that marks a symbolic level of maturity, given that sex is one mark of adult status. All of this in the heteronormative variety. The need to compete successfully in the heterosexual market has to do with a desire of approval of your own peers and not because you desire the other gender. Feminist researchers also focus their attention in the role of language in the exclusion or marginalization of women in the public sphere institutions and high status public positions. The researchers focus on the many ways in which girls and women are discriminated silenced and dominated in public contexts, and denied access to languages, literacies and speech styles that were needed to enter public institutions on equal terms, or undervalued because of stereotypes and prejudices about their way of speaking or writing. Today, this has changed and sexist ways are less normal and accepted, but serious power institutions are still male-preserved. Although there is abundant evidence that the preferred style of speech imposed on workers of both sexes is symbolically feminized style. 
given the ability to project certain kinds of effect using intonation and voice quality. Another linguistic and gender dimension is the so-called transidiomatic practices, by export of high-tech and migration. Women make up half of the world's economic migration, converting language an aspect of trade that needs to be addressed. On the one hand, the transnational market for female labor may affect gender patterns of second language, learning in the regions women come from. On the other hand, the relationship between immigrant women and the members of the host culture may have a distinctive effect on the nature of their bilingualism and their position in the host culture. Further research on this is needed, but future research will depend on the theoretical shift from difference to diversity as a framework for understanding language and gender. The second paper we chose is called Feminist Theories of Subjectivity by Roxana Elena Donku. There, she focuses on many things throughout the document. First, she talks about Judith Battle and her theory that gender identity is performative. She says that the masculine and the feminine are not opposites or different. On the contrary, gender identities are performative meaning that the social identity that is perceived as feminine or masculine is not the result of a natural essence, but a complex product of cultural factors and historical forces that cooperate to define the norms of proper feminine or masculine behavior. Moreover, she states that our bodies are different, and as a result of that, social, economic, and human differences are made. Also, she remarks that gender is political, since its entity is involved within a certain culture, society, and era. Nevertheless, there is a resistance against the stereotypes of heterosexual behavior, producing an oblivious change in how society sees gender. Secondly, she talks about Julia Kristeva and her theory of how subjectivity is a process, in which Kristeva declares that the regular notion of identity can be challenged by her theory of subjectivity as this continuous and constantly in process. In her theory, she puts the object as the main cause of the failing systems and the hierarchies of meaning, truth, law, and order. She says that there is no clear demarcation between object and subject, between the position of I and the outside world. Kristeva claims that our subjectivity is linked to the consciousness of our bodies, the imaginary boundary which separates our body from the exterior world. Regardless the boundaries of the body, this itself is differentiated by its fluids, sweat, tears, blood, menstrual blood, semen, etc. We try to get rid of those physical flows in order to feel secure in our sense of selfhood. The uncertainty is applicable to the subjectivity of our bodies as well as systems of culture. As we analyze the texts, language, gender, and sexuality, current issues, and new directions by Deborah Cameron and feminist theories of subjectivity, Judith Butler and Julia Kristeva by Roxana Elena Donku, we came across similar themes related to how gender identities have developed throughout history. What drew our attention the most is the fact that if you compare Cameron's and Donku's papers, you can clearly see a difference regarding the years in which they were published. 2005 and 2017. However, if you look deeply into both documents, there is not a noticeable disagreement within their analysis and the topics they approach. Firstly, from our point of view, we found many positive ideas within both papers. However, if you take a deep look at Cameron's work, you won't be able to find a quite broad spectrum of concepts like queer, liminal and others. Moreover, she doesn't go in depth in these concepts. She just mentions them on a superficial level. Secondly, Duncan's work talks about how masculinities and femininities construct the concepts of heteronormativity. Plus, she states that gender identities are constructed by society, culture and the year you live in. With that in mind, she says that a resistance from society is created due to the persistent changing of culture. Having said that, Donku delivers a lot of information regarding these concepts, yet she doesn't give tools to readers in order for them to apply in the future. Thirdly, 
Both documents and its investigation are focused on first world countries, developed ones. Conversely, not even once do they put their eyes on any third world country or its investigation regarding this problematic. We would have preferred to analyze a document which bears a likeness to our Chilean context, and in that way we would have learned more on how to approach this contingent theme in class as future teachers. All in all, despite the negative aspects we criticized in this video, we think that both documents are spot on given the fact that the ideas developed on them conveyed well-developed opinions on feminism that contribute to the conception of gender identities worldwide. To conclude this video, we will show you an interview to two in-service feminist teachers. However, one of them is a woman and the other one is a man. The question asked were how do you think that the situation of gender discrimination can be improved in EFL classroom from a feminist point of view? And what do you think about Chilean reality in this matter? Well, first of all, um, I believe that this could be addressed in two ways. First of all, methodological, and second of all, in the way that you, in the way that you um, discuss with students. Um, if we're discussing methodology and content, the content that you discuss with your students is uh, important. In this case, um, maybe you could find information regarding gender discrimination in the country or in other places and discuss it with your students uh, in debates, uh, Socratic seminars, etc. And when it comes to the way in which you approach your students, uh, the way in which you speak, either in English or Spanish, is also important because they see you as the role model, even if you don't want to, to be a role model and your language, your vocabulary, the way you address each one of your students and the respect that you create is essential in this case. And also I would like to address the concept of rapport which is the connection that you create with your students and when you trust your students and your students trust you uh, you can discuss almost everything and in this case would be it would be gender discrimination. I work in an all-male school in Instituto Nacional and in that context I believe that gender discrimination is very high uh, basically because of the teachers. Uh, many teachers discriminate women even though we don't have female students there. So it's pretty common to pass uh, through a classroom and listen to teachers uh, saying uh, negative things about society, in this case women, and especially the feminist movement, and saying that uh, women want to come into the school to st start having cooking classes. And of course uh, our reality needs to change, we need a change and we need it fast uh, and this must come from the newly qualified teachers, from trainees and from our generation. Uh, I think that uh, this is not so difficult to do in general. Uh, I just guess that it needs to have teachers who are prepared and who know about these topics, right? So for example, uh, something that I, I do teach as well as an English teacher, I do teach my students uh, f uh, uh, to speak in a gender new with a gender neutral pronoun, right? That's not so difficult to do, and you can just research if you don't know that. I follow a lot of um, web pages with um, with a gender. Uh, how can I say this? Like with a gender focus, right? So it's easy for me to know that, right? Uh, so many, may, maybe more people should do something like that. And that's one way in which I try to do it. But there are some, so many like minor things that are actually a problem that discriminate people by gender in the classroom, right? Like, I, I do believe that inclusive language in Spanish, right, is important and that maybe we should start using it. Or maybe if you don't want to deform language using another word, you can be more inclusive and say like niños y niñas, right? It's not so difficult, it takes longer, that's true, but it's not so difficult to do, right? Um, I guess that other things that sometimes happen, and they can happen in the classroom, and I've seen them happen, is for example, if it's something so small, once the projector wasn't working, right? And someone said that uh, a man offered to do it because the one who was doing it was me it's like yeah i can do it i know how to do it i might be a little bit smaller than you are <laughs> i'm not so tall but i can do it anyway right mm -hmm. 
or, or when something like that has happened, I can ask for help for boys and girls because everyone can do it. It's not so difficult, right? Mm -hmm. So assuming that only boys can do certain tasks and, other, and girls should do other tasks is not being mindful of this, right? So we can be mindful in that type of things or in the types of activities that we do, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe even creating activities that can um, make students reflect about it, right? So, uh, and not only referring to both men and women, but uh, also um, including um, LGBTQ plus community, right? Because sometimes we think that um, gay men are a certain way or gay women are a certain way, and that's not true. Because I work with pre-service teachers, I think it is changing slowly but steadily, right? Because I think that our students have the skills and uh, have reflected about these topics to in order to change some things. But still, I think we're very, very far away of this, right? We uh, we can see that in in the homeworks that uh, the homework that's assigned to students. My cousin, she has a, a, a boy, he's five years old, and sometimes boys have to bring certain type of material at school and girls have to bring another type of material, and that's teaching them from early on that genders are different and women are supposed to do one thing and men are supposed to do another, right? So I don't think that's, that's very helpful, but I do believe that um, by doing this and by having these new teachers going to those schools, it, it can definitely help. I, I, I have hopes, but yeah, whenever.